Welcome to this afternoon's um, third uh, session of our online bite size lunchtime learning sessions um, as part of our Greater Manchester Falls Prevention Awareness Week. Um, great to have um, you with us today and uh, just again thanks to our speakers um, for, for today pulling together today's session. Um, just to say I'm just going to run quickly um, through the agenda. Uh, unfortunately, our third speaker, um, Dr Chesney Craig from uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, um, did send through a recording and she was unable to attend. Um, but unfortunately, we've had a number of tech issues with the slides um, and we can't seem to get them to work. Um, so I'm going to uh, catch up with Chesney and make sure that we provide those as part of um, the recording in the online um, YouTube channel. Um, so apologies today, we will just have the first two presentations um, and our first speaker, Speaker uh, is going to be presenting on the Strength and Balance in Care Homes project, uh, Nile Bradley from AGK Bolton. And then we've also got um, both uh, Professor Chris Todd and uh, Dr Jodie Venture from the University of Manchester, who's going to be taking through a presentation um, around the fear of falling. Um, just a reminder as well, today's session is being recorded, um, so it will be uh, available by the end of the week on the GMCA YouTube channel and all the slides as well will also be shared as a, a PDF file for you to have access to and share with colleagues if useful. Um, so as we've only got two presentations, we're not as uh, as conscious with time, um, so uh, feel free to ask any questions um, and raise your hand uh, after both the presentations and we'll have plenty of time to, to get through those. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to Niall, if that's OK. Um, I'll move through the slides. So if you just want to let me know when to move on, that'd be great. Thanks, Niall. No problem. Bear with me. There we go. Hi, everybody. So I'm Niall and I'm the Strength and Balance Service Manager at Age UK Bolton, where we deliver force prevention, strength and balance exercise classes across Bolton. And we have also delivered previously in care homes and now we deliver each week in care homes on the project that I'm going to tell you about. So initially, pre uh, job move to the introduction. Sorry. <laughs> um, so pre COVID, we had some experience going into the care homes, delivering some strength and balance, sort of like chair based exercise sessions. Um, and then some funding came about with the Aging Well project, which we applied for. Um, we wrote a business case and then through a lot of trial and error during the first 12 to 15 months, we managed to secure a two year funding to take it from a pilot to a project. So that's an introduction about the program. And how it came about. Yeah, next slide. Have you got a different one to me? Is is that not the next slide? Is do you want me to? Okay. Has it, has that gone twice? I've just read that bit out. Are, are you oh. on object? It doesn't objective? matter. I, I've made it a bit different on mine. I've got one slide in between that. So basically, I think you might have a different one, but it doesn't matter. Um, so. We have a selection criteria before I go through the objectives and we've got a steering group which involves Age UK Bolton, Care Home Quality Assurance, NHS Lead Data Analyst, uh, a Senior Clinical Project Manager and the Neighbourhood Transformation Programme Manager. And every six to eight weeks we uh, meet up to discuss any challenges, share successes and we we'll select the future care homes for the ones that we're going to be working on. To do that, we use the data, the FARS data that's submitted from the car, from the care homes, from Northwest Ambulance Service and also from A&E. And then more recently, we've been working with community therapists that are going into the care homes to help with our selection criteria. But that's once we've moved into the care home, so they help us select our residents that we're going to be working with. And then I'm on to this slide. So our our main overall objective for the program is to reduce falls occurrences, um, to work towards re reducing falls related Northwest ambulance call outs, to reduce hospital admissions by increasing physical activity in the care homes, 
The project is delivered by the Strength and Balance team at Age UK Bolton, where we've got a, a variety of exercise qualifications for long-term health conditions, um, postural stability, Otago, Tai Chi, um, GP referral, dementia awareness. So we use all of our skills to deliver this project. Uh, initially, we wanted to deliver it as 12 weeks to each care home that we selected, but we realised that because of some um, issues regarding annual leave closures due to illnesses and things like that, that the 12 weeks were actually taking us a lot longer. So we adapted that and now we deliver 12 sessions, which consists of six sessions with between four and I'd probably say up to 10 now, we've put four and five on there um, and then one-to-one -one as well. Um, so yeah, we changed the, the 12 weeks to 12 sessions and we deliver alongside the staff that have also been selected with the care homes. And the idea is that the staff uh, shadow ourselves and we help the staff to build the confidence to be able to deliver the exercise sessions without us. Okay, next slide. From that, we've created some mini objectives. So we know that all movement is very beneficial and we want to try and reduce sedentary behaviour within the care homes. Also, the strength and balance exercises that we deliver are not always easy to um, <clears throat> easy to be done with some of the residents that we're working with. So we use movement to improve overall physical and mental well-being. We empower the residents to express themselves and move freely when they get the urge. We're trying to encourage staff to help the residents stand up for us. For example, if you've got a, a dementia client and they've got the urge to stand up, it's to encourage that standing and listen to the um, listen to the behaviour, the showing the signs that obviously there's a reason why they want to stand up. They might be uncomfortable. They might want to go to the toilet. They, they don't want to sit down anymore. They're a bit agitated. So it's sort of like instead of having that sit down, sit down because there are falls risk, it's encouraging that standing, um, that standing because obviously we know that that's a benefit as well, improving bone density in the legs and just getting a little bit of movement out of the resident. We use various equipment to do it. So we use Pilates balls, soft sponge balls, bean bags, music, and we try and be creative as well to encourage engagement. Next slide. There has been some challenges with the project. So I'll just talk you through some of those. Um, so initially, it, when we go into the care home, it's selecting staff that's, that's going to work alongside us. We know that um, staff that, that we, there is staffing issues, so it's sort of like having that one member of staff, one to two members of staff that we're able to work with every single week because we know how important it is um, for the longevity of the programme for the staff member to be doing it with us. So if we went in one week and we worked with one member of staff and then we went in the other week and worked with another member of staff, they're not going to have the time to build up the confidence to, sh to see the skills that we're trying to teach them to then be able to um, carry it on by themselves. Um, and, and also the staff already have a relationship with the clients if we're going in as strangers. The clients might not want to exercise, they don't want to engage with us, they don't know who we are. So it's having that member of staff to support us and then obviously we're helping the staff to empower their confidence to be able to do some movement with the residents as well. Uh, annual leave as well and um, closures due to COVID and other chest infections within the care homes and things like that have caused issues, hence why we also changed it to 12 sessions instead of 12 weeks. Yep, yeah, next slide. 
COVID, so care home closures, they're expected to occur now um, to limit the spread. Attendance, so although we did select residents that we're going to be working with from one week to the next due to not feeling up to it on the day or having a hospital appointment or something else, the same people weren't, weren't always able to attend each week. And also with some of the residents, a class setting wasn't always suitable so we now do a group session with like six to eight residents and then from that we might highlight like another four people that we can work with on a one-to-one -one basis um, also when we first went in i used to go in with like a session plan and if i didn't get the outcome that i wanted i used to walk away from the care home thinking that i'd not done a good job and that it was a failure um, so we worked with empowered movement and later life training to understand what the expectations were, uh, especially for people living with dementia. And then now what I've realised is that for somebody to have a 20 second outburst of, you know, uh, happiness or an expression or getting a bit of movement, whether it's throwing and catching a ball, playing tug of war with a resistance band or doing some leg kicks, it's sort of like given me the confidence to know that that is actually uh, that's beneficial to that person because from experience care home staff have said that that's the most um, they've seen people smile in a long time and things like that so it's having that uh, empowerment to know that it's not a failure if you just get someone to smile for 20 seconds next slide so for our successes we've Obviously, I've given you a lot of challenges there, um, but we have a lot of successes as well. Um, and we are starting to see some data coming through to show that the care homes that we were working with are actually levelling out with the care homes that we've not chosen to work with. Um, we are part of a wider programme, so there is a lot of other services going into the care homes um opticians there's oral health there's therapists uh, nutrition and hydration and then obviously we've got the strength and balance project as well so all these services working together as a team is having an impact on falls within the care homes um, and we've got some data as well now coming through that i've got on the next slide um, we've got other data, but I just thought these ones were the um, best ones to share. So I'm really sorry if you can't see it very well. So basically, the ones that I've picked, if you look at the purple line, that's the care homes in Bolton that we've not chosen to work in. That's because their falls rates were quite good initially um the or they didn't have um serious ones resulting in hospital admissions or an ambulance call out so the care homes that we started that we picked in the uh, steering group is actually the blue line so as you can see it started higher up which was why we chose them and then over the course of the pilot you can see that it's starting to drop now um, so the first one is the Northwest Ambulance Callouts per 100 residents. And then the graph on the other side is the A&E rates, the A&E uh, admissions per 100 residents. Um, so you can see there that we have got some data now backing up our programme of work. And then instead of just uh, showing you all our data, I just thought I would show you some videos that would actually really highlight our program that we've got. So I've got two videos, one's a portrait and one's landscape. And then obviously we've got some pictures here on the on that PowerPoint as well, just showing some of the group exercise that we do.
So, it, sorry about that. If I'd have known they'd have played like that, I would have put the videos on the, like their own slide. Oh, it's um, fine. Don't worry. I'm sure everyone could see that. Yeah. Um, is that the last slide, Niall? Yeah, that, I think yeah. that's the last slide, yeah. So if anybody's got any questions. Brilliant. I'll just stop sharing. Um, brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Niall. It was amazing to see the videos and see it all in, in action and see people's uh, enjoyment. Um, have we got any thoughts, comments or questions for Niall with regards to the project? Karen? How do you actually, actually choose the residents that you're going to work with? So the uh, health therapists have, that may be working with the clients already, if they've had a, a fall and they've been in hospital, they might have been highlighted through that. So they might um, they might give us a list of names that we've started to work with, but initially we literally speak to the care home managers and we keep and we speak to the care home staff and uh, anybody that they feel would benefit from the program and also that may be able to engage with the program better. Um, so obviously we don't discourage people taking part if we're doing it as a group and we do it in the communal room where there's lots of residents if somebody in the corner suddenly has a spur to want to join in we then we let them join in but then we break that down into one-to-one -one sessions as you've seen with the two gentlemen on the video purely because they're going to get the most benefits out of the program um may it be somebody that's a wanderer wanders up and down the care home there are falls risk but so if we can do exercise to improve their bone density and their muscles, then we would work with that resident. Sometimes they don't want to join in. Um, we also encourage the family to, to come into the care home with us whilst we're doing it and help us so that they can do them with, with them. We provide them with booklets and exercise sessions. We've got some videos on YouTube that we, we let them use as well. Um, but yeah it's just a, basically a discussion within the within the care home with the with the staff and the manager sometimes the residents might pick themselves if we go into a communal room and they're all asleep it'll be, we'll try and wake them up be like come on let's do some exercise um whichever ones get up and start dancing through their own free will sometimes uh we we work with Brilliant. Thanks, Niall. Um, any other comments, thoughts, questions? Chris? I wondered what input you'd had from later life training and to what degree you were able to deliver sort of fame or the uh, exercises to... Yeah, so originally I had an idea in my head that we would go into the care homes and deliver fame um but because of the i suppose the the majority of residents in the care homes that are suffering falls and things like that they can't always understand the instructions of what we're trying to ask them to do and i also had like a session like i wanted to try and get them to do eight reps of a certain exercise and things like that so with later life what we did was i just asked them what their opinion was on the program and it was a case of trying to reduce the sedentary behavior within the care homes and get residents in care homes more active so we try to encourage um, the care homes to put an exercise class on a chair-based exercise class uh, on the timetable so now what we do when we go into a care home we'll have a look for the timetable do they have an activity timetable they might have things like dominoes uh, movie time timetable on so now we try and encourage them to some of them already do but we try and encourage them to have like a chair-based exercise session uh, on the timetable so that they know that it's the same time every week that they've got that exercise session and then the family can also look at that timetable and say right well you've got your exercise that day so i'm going to come in and make sure you do it or or make sure the care home are doing it things like that um but yeah 
in terms of fame and actually getting those exercises um it's quite challenging on the videos you can see with the gentleman that they did really well and one of them's got dementia and the other one has parkinson's when you first go in they're quite stiff and if they've been sat a while they'll be have like a bit of a jutter doing a sit to stand is really challenging but as soon as we've mobilized and warmed up the joints they move a lot more freely and then that can be a pain relief to some of them as well can i ask another follow-up to that so um do you know i mean you showed us some information which was the admissions and the ambulance call outs did you have information on forms actual yeah. forms the numbers I don't, don't remember seeing that. I miss it. Um, so not on the sh not on the slideshow, but we do have uh, data with regards to the numbers of falls within the care homes. We we go over that in the steering group to yeah. quite a lot of uh, detail. To be honest, uh, if you wanted some information, we could speak to the uh, data analysis analysis, and we can provide you with that. Okay, I just wondered if you had it because if that's the aim of the project. It'd be great to be able to show you reduce falls in the care homes. Yeah. yeah. I'll let somebody else from the, in the chat speak. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Sue Dewhurst has asked um, how you'll ensure sustainability of the project. Um, so that is one thing that we're working on at the moment. We have uh, generated a questionnaire that's going to get some feedback within the care homes we also know that there's like staff turnover and things like that um, we are going back into previous care homes that we've worked in finding out if they need any further support and if and making sure that they're confident enough to carry on the program um, but yeah so we've got two years at the moment so we was a pilot for 15 months and now we've created it into a two year project. So we've got two years to ensure that we can generate the sustainability and encourage further movement and physical activity within the care homes. Brilliant. Thanks, Niall. Um, just another couple of questions from Natalie in the chat um, around the size of care homes in Bolton um, and whether they vary um, in terms of sort of bed capacity and whether you find care homes who have sort of are a bigger company and a bigger um, organisation, do you find them more supportive of the project in, in terms of being involved? Natalie, do come in if you want to add to that. The, the, the care homes are of various sizes across Bolton um, and we've worked so far in a good mix, to be honest. Uh, I'll give you an example, like one of the care homes we went in had different wards, so they might have been like a dementia ward where they was quite bad. So we didn't, because of the sustainability of the program and the residents being able to take part in the exercise as much as possible, we decided that we wouldn't work with, with that, with that uh, ward, we'd work on another ward um where the residents were able to get the most out of it because obviously we've got it was a project and now it's a pilot we wanted to make sure that we uh got the most evidence so we wanted to work with the ones that would get the most benefit um you know ones that were able to hold a conversation as much as possible ones that could follow your instructions and then like i said as well as that we didn't single anybody out if somebody wanted to join in and and do the feathers or do the chair based exercise, just dancing to the music or empowering them to have a little stand up and a dance, then we allowed that as well. Um, but at first we, I did have to break down my own barriers and and uh, stop being Sergeant Major and more being a little bit more laid back. <laughs> uh, is there anything el else that I can add to that answer? I think, um... Like there's quite a lot because I think here on the island we've got a really aging population and I know that quite a lot of the care homes are like very different in size so I think it's interesting to get that insight so from Bolton of how you would approach it because I know here 
we we do have like some of the um highest proportion of elderly residents in different parts of the country so interesting i think i've got covered all the questions but i do know one of my colleagues is actually on the call as well so if she's got any other questions i'll get us put them in the chat thank you some of the um care homes actually have uh activity staff um initially they had funding to employ the activity staff and and then i think that stopped but some of the care homes actually kept them on so when we go into the care homes, we work with those with those staff members if we can, if they've got an allocated person um, and, and they know the residents already. So it helps with that breaking down the barriers and introducing us to the residents that we want to be working with. Brilliant. Thanks, Niall. Uh, I'll just bring in Pat um, first and then we've got just one more question in the chat. Thanks, Pat. Hi, I'm, I'm Pat. I work with Niall on on this uh, on the care homes project, and I just noticed that uh, Kaylee's saying that they would like to start a project like this in the Isle of Wight. Um, and there's also just the question about, you know, completing assessments and and the part of the program, and also within regards to the questions that Chris asked. We we're happy to share any information at all um, with anyone who's who is interested. If you are looking at starting something like this. As now stated, we do quite comprehensive reports um, quarterly, actually, for the steering group um, and for our commissioners. The how we how we um, assess individual clients and how we manage progress and outcomes, you know, and what does that look like, is something that we're very much exploring this year. And the pilot, it was very, you know, it was a, a real test and learn period because. As you can imagine, engaging initially with the care homes themselves and then having the appropriate um, residents selected in order to you know, ensure engagement, ensure that people could participate. That was very much the, you know, the pilot stage of things. What works? What doesn't work? How can we can communicate with everyone? How can we communicate with the residents? Um, this year, because we, we are seeing really good progress so this year is very much about sustainability and it's very much about revisiting the care homes ensuring ensuring that they're continuing with the programs as now said um but also how do we measure that going forward um the data is good uh, obviously we use case studies we use case studies across everything we do um but there's been a lot of learning around um as as now said empowered movement how do we engage with people who are living with um dementia for example so yes but really i was just bobbed on i know I've, i'm repeating what some now has already said but i'm really just bobbing on to say if anybody would like inf any information would like to see a couple of our most recent reports i think that would be informative especially if, if you are considering starting a program like this in your own region brilliant thanks thank Pat. you um just a, a question from me i know you um obviously collecting data in relation to the reduction of falls and, and ambulance call outs have you heard of any sort of as, as part of the case studies that you mentioned pat have you heard any stories around um the wider benefits so not just um in relation to movement, but whether people are able to get dressed better themselves or perform all this tasks of daily living that they weren't before that have come from care home staff who've, who've been able to see that kind of that impact. Well, that's that's something that, that you know, that's really what we're working on, you know, this this in this period now, um, because um, I'm sure now I mentioned this as well, the well-being aspects you know, uh, uh, this, there's a huge increase in just the general well-being in, in people who are able to participate. Um, and one of the project leads from the NHS was on the steering group. We've talked a lot about how do we incorporate th uh, this movement into the daily tasks, just as you say, so that, you know, getting up in the morning, washed, dressed, even going going into the, the lunchroom or the dinner room and um various activities that they would perform anyway but how can we introduce more of our movement and activity into that and how do we measure that just as you say um because the simplest thing as far as you know washing and raising your hands and and so on that's you know that's that's movement or, you know it's all movement so um yeah that's very much something that we're focused on at the moment brilliant thanks pat um i think there's just one final question but i'm i'm 
I'm not sure if you uh, you did answer that in the chat, Niall, around um, whether you complete an assessment for clients who participate in the programme, and if so, what's included in that assessment? Yeah, so where possible, we try to do the PSI functional grid. So we'll measure hamstring flexibility, internal, internal and external shoulder flexibility, um, sit to stand test if we can, timed up and go 180 degree turn and we've got a few case studies from the functional grid where where people have improved um but if i'd included those in the slide we'd have been here a while um so i just thought it would be better to show our successes through the video but obviously we've got the we've got things like that on our board reports Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. Any other final comments or questions before we move on to our next presentation? No? Okie doke. Well, I'll just reshare the slides. Just going to say as well, me and Pat have got another meeting that we need to go to, so we might drop off. No problem at all. Um, if you, uh, if there are any other questions that come in the chat, I'll I'll contact you and um, follow on, up on those if that's okay. No problem. Thank you, Thanks everybody. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for the presentation. Okay. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to um, Dr. Jodie Venture and Professor uh, Chris Todd, who's going to take us through uh, fears and concerns around falling. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks, Beth, um, for the introduction. Um, it's it's going to be mainly me speaking today, but I know that Chris is on the call. Should anybody have any questions for Chris as well? Um, so as Beth mentioned, so I'm going to be talking about the fear and concerns about falling and how psychological factors subsequently affect our balance and risk for falls. So next slide, please. Um, so I just really wanted to run through some early take home messages with you. Um, so concerns and fear about falling are extremely common in our older adult population. And we're seeing prevalence rates of between 21 and 85 percent at the moment. So that's really highlighting the scale and number of older adults who are presenting with increased concerns about falling. But what we do know is that when an older adult presents with a high concern, it's often an indicator that something isn't quite right um, and that there is actually a cause for concern that we need to investigate both as researchers and clinicians. I think it's really imperative to highlight here the variety of negative outcomes and byproducts that come as a result of increased concern about falling. So some of the examples I've got here on the slide, um, such as reduced mental well-being, but really one of the main ones is this activity avoidance that we see as a result of this increased concern about falling when older adults are engaging in activities in which they find high risk. This really does lead to physical deconditioning, which um, indirectly reduces strength and impairs balance. Um, we know that both of these things are risk factors for falls. Um, so it's really about trying to, uh, to focus on those. But really further concerns are that we start to see a reduced quality of life and actually indirectly social isolation from this. Um, so concerns about falling can often start to be a more negative health journey, and that's why it's such an important topic that I want to share with you uh, today. Um, but despite knowing these things, um, there is still questions in research about how this leads to incre increased risk uh, future falls, which I'm hoping to go through with you today. So next slide, please, Beth. So before anything else, I just wanted to really discuss with you the terminology around fear and concerns about falling. Um, both in clinical practice and in research, they are often used interchangeably, but they are actually distinct psychological constructs, um, which I'll go on to explain in further detail. So um, in September last year, the World Falls Guidelines were released um, and that actually involved some work um, and the co-creation with older adults and the discussions around concerns versus fear. Um, and it, it was decided that more appropriately, um, we would now refer to um, this as a concern about falling. So this was because the term um, appeared as less intense and emotional for older adults. And we're really always looking for ways to make it more socially acceptable for older adults to disclose these concerns with us. Um, and then we can start to learn about this, uh, this associated behaviour. So it's important to note that concerns really are the lasting feeling of dread and apprehension about situations that are believed to threaten and challenge an individual's balance. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about uh, fear in a second. So next slide, please, Beth. 
So really concerns about falling stem from um, a, an older adult becoming aware and, and having this new recognition that um, situations in which they find themselves in put them at increased risk for falls and particularly um, an injurious risk of falls. So it's it's more about these uh, sort of concerns and worries around activities that are likely to, to induce a fall here. Um, but really as well, just about how um, those adaptations that people make as a as a byproduct of the concerns can maybe both be helpful and uh, a hindrance as well. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So when we start to look at a fear of falling, then um, this construct is slightly different and has uh, multiple predisposing causes. So one of them, uh, as I previously mentioned, is the perception that balance is threatened. And with another one being as well, these negative experiences uh, that the older adults experience once they've had the, the first four. Um, this same thing applies when they uh, know maybe friends and family uh, in the ageing population that have also had a fall and have maybe seen the negative consequences. But it really can be as simple for any of us. Um, you know, it's not just an older adult problem. Um, you know, any of us could find ourselves in the situations of the three images on this slide um, and just to happen to notice that we've got this increased concern or subsequent fear. Uh, next slide, please, Beth. <clears throat> So when we begin to look at the differences between concern and fear, um, fear is actually the emotional and behavioural response to the concern. So it's it's no longer the sort of lasting uh, dread and apprehension about balance being threatened, and it's more about the emotional and behavioural responses we show um, in relation to our balance being threatened. So that kind of forms that postural threat box in the, the bottom left. So I'm hoping from this diagram that you can see how concerns develop about, um, around that initial um, recognition that we are likely to fall. But then when maybe those falls start to happen more frequently, we develop these emotional and behavioural protective responses to try and save ourselves from those things. Uh, next slide, please, Beth. So really, oh, sorry, just back one. It, it's just, it's the same, but it's slightly different. Yeah. Um, so as researchers, we're really consciously always trying to determine um, what responses uh, to fear of falling are protective uh, and what are maladaptive and what we mean by those are, uh, what are helping people prevent future falls and then maybe what are um, creating situations that actually are hindering people and indirectly uh, causing uh, falls to actually occur. Uh, next slide, please. So traditionally, the concept um, of a fear of falling was very much a process um, that we thought older adults uh, went through. So really, this was surrounding maybe older adults having having a first fall. And then the process would often uh, then heighten an individual's awareness, which would develop the fear of falling. Um, and as I previously mentioned, it often leads to a period of deconditioning, which is basically um, avoiding activities in which people think are, are quite risky in terms of I would fall if I engaged in this activity. But as I've also previously mentioned, what happens here is then people end up with a reduced strength and poorer balance. And then they find themselves on this continuum over and over of um, finding themselves okay, I'm now uh, at risk of future falls. And then the process uh, starts again. And whilst this construct sort of remains true, uh, more recent research has identified that maybe not all older adults conform to this process. So as I was talking about on the previous slide, we have both behavioural and emotional responses to, to fall risk and what that looks like is very different from person to person, which um, I'll highlight with you in a second. But I'd just like to draw your attention to um, a recent commentary that was published uh, on behalf of the Concerns About Falling Working Group. So this is really around why as clinical practitioners we should be asking patients about their concerns about falling much earlier. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really quite a short document that actually is definitely worth a read if you, if you have a spare five minutes of your time. Um, next slide, please, Beth. Um, so as I've mentioned, so many concerns and falls, uh, many concerns about falling, sorry, um, stem from a feeling that our balance is threatened. So it might just be uh, similar to those images that we saw previously. We find ourselves on a steep slope or a narrow flight of stairs or really just walking outside in winter in those icy conditions. Um, but what really differentiates uh, one older adult from another is the level of control that people uh, have over their ability to prevent a fall, really. So more recent research has highlighted that um, there is quite 
distinct differences in terms of low and high perceptions of control that older adults do have. Um, so really, an older adult that presents with a low perception of control would be very similar to the uh, the information that I've got on the left of this slide. So really what that looks like in an older adult is persistent worries and panic, which really lead to negative thought processes and often outcomes. So this doesn't um, lead to any adaptations to behaviour in useful ways and instead it actually distracts um, an older adult from performing the exercise or mobility that they were they were hoping to do. And actually, it just leads to um, complete distraction, which often results in falls. So they are probably most likely to be um, the older adults that conform to that process, which I shared on the previous slide. So, you know, have a fall and then develop a, a, a more serious sort of concern, fear about falling and then avoid those activities and subsequently become deconditioned. We do, however, uh, start to see now some older adults with with high perception of control over their falls risk. Um, and actually, um, we never really knew this previously, but these worries are actually viewed as being quite helpful. Um, because what this means is that an, a particular older adult will see their um, perceived worry as being controllable and their fall risk. So what it allows is it allows older adults to make protect protective adjustments um, to prevent falls and that indirectly reduces fear. So as you can see really from the two quotes, one highlights how uh, these ruminative thoughts um, continue and spiral out of control and you know the, the worrying stops me being able to do what I need to do when I'm out walking whereas uh, another old ad adult might present with I'm still at the age where I'm I'm still at the stage sorry where I'm able to concentrate and apply myself and I can avoid falls so they're, they're presenting very differently in these situations and it's important to to consider this when we're looking at concerns about falling um next slide please Beth so with this in mind, really, and the early take home messages uh, on behalf of myself and the rest of the concerns about falling group, we really wanted to, to determine um, whether an increased concern about falling did actually predict future falls. Um, so we know that there are associations and, and negative byproducts of having increased concern about falling. But do we really know that if somebody has an increased concern about falling, they are like more likely to fall than somebody who doesn't present with this concern? So in order to answer this question, we're currently undertaking a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, as the reference suggests, it's still very much in preparation and these are very early findings. Um, but we really wanted to ask this question. So we've screened uh, almost 11,000 articles to, to do this. Uh, and what we've actually been left with is 64 sort of independent studies that we're able to include in our review. Um, next slide, please, Beth. Um, so as I've mentioned, we are in the very early stages of our analysis. However, 76% um, of our articles have actually found a positive association between having high concerns about falling and actually falling when followed up over a six to 12 month period. So those adults are present, those older adults are presenting with um, maybe uh, an increased concern about falling, maybe at baseline in research studies. And then what they're doing is they're filling out monthly phone or telephone diaries over a six to 12 month period um, and their falls are being documented. So that is being compared to a control group in each of those studies. Um, so we are also found that 24 percent of articles didn't didn't find an association um, and these are likely to be um, attributed to uh, some of the control mechanisms that I spoke about on the earlier slides. Um, so we do need to do some further investigation in order to see the different uh, presentation of how concern about falling affects the cohorts in these studies. And really some further work is needed, and we know this, to determine what makes uh, older adults approach fall risk differently. Um, and there is actually a, a scale out there at the moment that looks at how control, how much control individuals have over, over their fall risk. Um, so next slide, please, Beth. Um, so for those that aren't aware, um, there are some clinical recommendations around concerns about falling. So the World Falls Guidelines uh, for the Management for Older Adults was actually released in September of last year. 
Um, and one of the first recommendations from the, the World Falls guidelines was that um, clinicians should be including concerns about falling uh, in the comprehensive fall risk assessment of older people. So this just isn't around uh, those older adults that we expect to have a high concern about falling. It's really just in older adults in general to try and capture that concern uh, in much younger life years. Um, we know that this concern should be measured using uh, standardised and validated instruments to affect to um, measure concerns. So for this, uh, we would very much like to point you to the Falls Efficacy Scale International and the Short FESI as well. Um, and lastly, uh, we would recommend using the same scale, so the Short FESI for assessing concerns about falls in both acute and long term care facilities. <clears throat> um, next slide, please, Beth. So I just wanted to really quickly run through the Falls Efficacy Scale International with you uh, for anybody who maybe hasn't seen this scale before or isn't familiar. Um, so we have both uh, the, the longer version, which is a 16 item scale, and then we have um, and then there has been subsequently a shorter seven item scale developed. Um, so really, this is looking at the concerns about the possibility of falling when engaging in a range of activities. So it asks older adults um, to rate their concern being one, not concerned at all, to four, which is very concerned. Um, so again, I would just like to point you uh, to a fantastic review done by uh, my colleague, so Professor Chris Todd, who's who on the call, but also Dr Lisa McGarrigal, who it was a systematic review and meta-analysis that um, found that both of the scales had high quality evidence to support internal consistency, reliability and construct validity when determining concerns about falling in this population. So um, the 16 item scale was developed in 2005 and then shortly followed by the seven item scale in 2008. But both of these scales have continued to be widely used uh, in both research and clinical practice. The tests, as you see here, are really simple, efficient, uh, quick to, to use tests um, that are available in, in sort of 42 plus languages. We've got uh, colleagues uh, all over the world developing further languages as we speak. And I'd just like to point you to the uh, web page at the bottom here. Uh, all of the material is available to download from, from our web page. And me and Chris are more than happy to answer any questions you may have about that. Um, it really is quite simple. So we've got the cutoff points here uh, in the bottom right of the slide, uh, indicating the high, medium and low concern cutoff points for both the 16 item scale and the seven item scale. So we would really be expecting uh, older adults who score above 28 on the, lo uh, the longer scale and 14 on the shorter scale to really be presenting with, with high concerns about falling. Um, and this scale is available and recommended uh, in part, as part of the World Fall Guidelines also. And it's just the next slide, please, Beth. So really, I think my uh, it was a very whistle stop tour, I know, but very final take home messages uh, around concerns about falling are that they are extremely common in older adults and do often lead to negative outcomes that um, far outweigh just that initial concern about falling. You know, we know about the deconditioning and we know about that social isolation. So tackling this early um, can really have uh, additional benefits. The most recent World Fall guidelines are advising all clinicians to ask their patients about concerns about falling routinely, and that's just not those who maybe have uh, underlying conditions or other mobility issues. We really want to try and tackle this early so that we can um, allow older adults uh, the opportunity to have uh, higher control over their fall risk, as we know that plays an important role. Um, again, I'd just like to reiterate that the, the FESI is a structured, validated way to measure this concern. Uh, as I hopefully I've demonstrated to you on the previous slide. Um, but really just to mention that the disclosure of this concern really does prevent the opportunity for clinical engagement. And then we're able to hopefully signpost individuals with this concern onto uh, the appropriate interventions. But ultimately, we really just want to enable older adults to have greater control over their fall risk, um, really just to continue uh, all the great work that we do as part of this group and wider to prevent future injurious falls. And that just takes me to the final slide, Beth. Um, yep, so there is the uh, 
an email address for both Chris and I if you have any questions and also the web page for the FESI where you'll find a lot of really helpful information around concerns about falling. Um, yeah, and I'd just like to lastly thank the, my wider colleagues for from the Concerns About Falling Working Group for their expertise in advancing this work th further and just to state that both Chris and I are funded uh, by the NIHR for this work. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, um, Jodie. That's great. And I've learnt a lot there as well in terms of um, the fear of falling. So that's been really useful. Any, I'm conscious of time, um, any final or any comments or questions um, or thoughts um, for either Chris or Jodie? I'll just double check the chat. Um, I don't think we have any in there. Some comments from Chris. Um, lots of positive comments about the presentation, which is great. Um, yeah, I guess so I guess my question is more to the group really of whether we've got any clinicians on the call that do. Um, use the FESI or ask questions around fears of falling um, already or, or whether this is something that's inspired you to um, to introduce that into your clinical practice. Uh, Magdalena, do you want to come in? Hi, I'm not Magdalena, I'm Janet, I'm with Magdalena. Um, yeah, it, we, we do use the FESI actually. We start using the short FESI generally as um, an outcome measure and to indicate a need for falls and then our occupational therapists are looking more at that. You did mention about identifying uh, clinical interventions and clinical needs. Is is there any sort of more research that you've done on 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 those and what what is um, any evidence based clinical interventions that you've identified? Yeah, so we, we thought we might get this question and I suppose the important thing is not to test uh, these things routinely and then have no way of, of signposting people on. So um, we so as part of that, the commentary, which I, I shared earlier, it has got um, some recommendations and evidence behind um, the ways that individuals are signposted on. But really, they are in the form of both sort of like physical and emotional intervention. So we've got um, cognitive behavioural therapy for the th for the thought process behind those days fears about falling well, but also we, we we can't do that so. we more regularly signpost onto the strength and balance classes in the community so we've got a separate project uh, ongoing at the university which i'll be talking about tomorrow um in terms of the provision across all 10 of the boroughs in greater manchester but those strength and balance uh, classes um obviously improve the the balance and uh, the strength of the older adults which we signpost and then we start to see the reductions uh, and we have got some studies to to share with you on that if that'd be useful uh, yeah that, that would be useful um so the mental health services then are you referring into mental health services for cbt therapies is that is that where you you've been referring to because obviously in physical yeah medicine a lot of ORTs aren't trained in CBT so it what well, I mean I know we can look at CBT techniques but it's not the same as CBT is it so what 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 resources are around do you, do you know that first specifically for fear of falling has that been looked at sorry Chris did you want to did you want to say something there or not I wasn't trying to know but um. no okay we um so there is um as part of the commentary as well we know there's a whole uh, piece of work and further funding that needs to be uh sort of obtained to look at this work further because um there aren't actually sufficient pathways at the moment for us to be able to signpost purely just for CBT um they become uh, they come through other sort of the strength and balance pathway in terms of behavioral change methods and and other things are combated with that but no there isn't a particular route in Greater Manchester at the moment, um, which obviously requires uh, further work, which we intend to look into. So I think it's a problem nationally as well um, in terms of signposting people on just for uh, CBT methods to reduce. But yeah, it's trying to combat it as a whole. So thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Great questions. Um, 
I think we've just got one question in the chat. Um, bear with me one second. Um, from uh, Mildred around other than the F, um, other than the FESI, is there any alternative outcome measures similar to this? Um, yes, there are, um, but they are not um, currently recommended uh, in clinical practice. So it really is just the FESI and short FESI. Um, and there's a f uh, there's two others which are uh, icon uh, very similar methods um, that basically I that they demonstrate the images uh, of the activities in which we ask participants to select their concern. Um, so yes, there are other scales that you maybe come across, but they do not have the same um, sort of evidence-based uh, sort of backing as we would suggest uh, from the FESI. Brilliant, thank you. I'm really conscious of time and I know we've run over, um, so I am going to have to wrap up, but if you do have any questions, do pop them in the chat and I can follow up with Chris and Jodie and, and get back to you directly if that's okay. Um, so thanks ever so much um, for your time and uh, to all the speakers today, but also um, for everyone for attending. Um, my email is on the final slide, so please do email me if you've got any uh, follow up feedback or questions. Um, and if you are attending one of our uh, sessions, either tomorrow or Friday, we look forward to seeing you then. Um, but if not, thanks ever so much for your time today and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.